Welcome everyone, today's video is late. I will explain why, but to bring you all up to speed, last Thursday the review embargo lifted for AMD's long anticipated new fastest CPU for gaming, the $450 8 core 16 thread Ryzen 7 5800X3D, which is pretty much a slightly lower clocked 5800X, but with triple the cache thanks to a new packaging method developed by AMD and TSMC called 3D vCache. It goes from 32 megabytes with the 5800X to 96 megabytes on the 5800X3D. The added cache helps boost performance with some tasks and makes no difference in others, but the main focus for AMD is gaming. And indeed, reviewers have found the 5800X3D to be about 10 to 20% faster in CPU limited gaming tests than a regular 5800X or even the 12 core 5900X, while also generally keeping up with and sometimes outperforming Intel's fastest gaming CPU, the Core i9-12900K and my numbers back that up. So to be probably too direct about what's in store for today's video, let me give you the bullet points and do note that I make timestamps for all my videos so you can use those to jump ahead. If you wanna know why I'm late, I'll start with that little story after the break. If you want more benchmark charts, I've got plenty of those too, but if you already watched last week's reviews, it's likely going to be more of the same. And if you just want my summary and conclusion, like I said, use the timestamps to skip ahead to that. And oh yeah, thanks for watching this video. Excellent. The Thermaltake Tower 100 is back in a variety of colors. This unique and versatile mini ITX chassis has three tempered glass panels for an expansive view of your epic build. The vertical orientation means support for big three slot graphics cards and tall air coolers. And every side and top panel is removable, which makes building or accessing the inset magnetic dust filters way easier. This case performed well in my testing, even with the high end 5900X and RTX 3080 system. It has full size ATX power supply support, and it's now available in turquoise, metallic gold, and racing green. Click the sponsor link in the description for more. I have a love-hate relationship with benchmark review videos. On the one hand, I enjoy being among the first to test out new PC hardware, and I've put in a lot of work over the years to develop manufacturer relationships so I can arrange pre-launch review samples. On the other hand, when there's a review embargo in place, it means there's a deadline, and things can get stressful because running benchmarks can be extremely time-consuming. A big part of planning for me is deciding what I have time to test in order to get a good set of comparisons lined up, how many CPUs or GPUs to compare against, what settings to use, whether or not to overclock, and which games or other software solutions I will benchmark. Also, since I do video reviews rather than written, I need to make sure that there's time to analyze the data, write a script, edit the footage, get all the slides made, and to double check my work to make sure I didn't mess up. I have developed some standard routines for this, and usually I end up doing all the benchmarking and writing a couple days before the embargo lifts so I can shoot the video the morning of the day prior so my editor Joe can edit while I finish off slides or shoot an extra voiceover or do whatever else needs to be done. Then I'll do a final edit later in the afternoon or evening and hopefully get all those finishing touches like a thumbnail and timestamps and video description and stuff done by 10 p.m. or midnight or sometimes 2 or 3 a.m. so the video can go live when the embargo lifts, which tends to be at 6 a.m. Pacific time on whatever day the manufacturer chooses. This approach has worked out in the past for me, for the most part, and I'm usually okay with it as long as I know a big launch is coming, but especially in that last 24 to 36 hours prior to the embargo lift, there's not a lot of room for things to go wrong. So on Tuesday night, last week, about a day and a half before the deadline, when all I had left to do in order to get the benchmark numbers I wanted was run like five more gaming tests on my 12900K test system, Suddenly, that system just refused to boot. Even worse, it booted, but it was inconsistent. I ran one gaming test fine, but then the system did an instant shutdown during the middle of the next one. Then it refused to boot properly with memory XMP settings enabled. Then it seemed to just stop working with the G-Skill DDR5 kit that I've been using for months and only worked with a much lower clocked Kingston kit. Then I started to freak out a little bit because time was not on my side. I needed these numbers to fill out my charts. I needed to shoot first thing the next morning. And if there's one thing that gets under my skin more than hardware issues that require time-consuming troubleshooting steps to figure out, it's when that happens with hardware that I've used multiple times before with no problems. So long story short, I spent three or four hours trying different things, including a motherboard swap and a clean Windows installation, before giving up at about 2 a.m. or so and going to bed. Of course, the next day I finally figured it out. The issue was fixed when I changed my Corsair AX1600i power supplies custom-sleeved cable kit out for the stock modular cables that shipped with the unit. And many of you 
you might think, Paul, that would have been one of the first things I would have tried. And in fact, why are you even using non-stock power supply cables in a test bed anyway? Well, back when I first switched to using these power supplies last year, which are helpful because they can support just about any hardware configuration I might throw at them with 1600 watts of power, I had the same thought. I wanted to use the sleeved kit for the looks, I know. I do make videos after all, aesthetics are often a consideration at least, but I was worried that they might affect performance. So months ago, when I had more time, I tested them pretty extensively with my power supply tester. I also did multiple benchmark runs with the stock cables and the aftermarket ones on that system, and they all seemed to work just fine. So I'm not sure what changed. It could be that a pin connector just jostled loose somewhere, or that these non-sleeved power supplied side mini connectors developed a problem over time. But by the time I figured that out, my timeline was completely buggered and I knew I wasn't going to be able to hit the embargo deadline. Then I decided to do tech news on time for last week rather than pushing that out as well. And then it was Easter weekend, which was solidly booked with family activities. And now I am finally making this video. So there's my explanation such as it is. And if I plow through the rest of this video, now you know why. So here goes, my test systems were running Windows 11, and as discussed in my 12900K and 12600K launch review videos, I enabled multi-core enhancement and adaptive boost for Intel platforms and precision boost overdrive and auto OC for AMD to better take advantage of the high-end Corsair H150i Elite LCD 360 millimeter liquid cooling unit that I was using, while also staying within somewhat reasonable limits for most home users with similar configurations. Do note that the 5800X 3D does not support overclocking though, so if if my AMD comparisons are a little bit tighter versus other reviews, that is the reason. Here's a chart showing the comparison CPUs for today. The 12600K numbers I'm using are the top configuration from that review video, which was DDR4 3600 memory and the Gigabyte MCE settings running all cores at 4.9 gigahertz. The 12900K is running a DDR5 6000 kit from G-Skill and all others are using a DDR4 3600 CL16 kit. For AMD representation, we have the 16 core 32 thread 5950X, 12 core 24 thread 5900X, 8 core 16 thread 5800X, and a 6 core 12 thread 5600X. Here's a quick look at the test bed setups, and for consistency, I used these parts across all systems. The power supply is a Corsair AX1600i 80 plus titanium unit, the GPU is an NVIDIA RTX 3090 Founders Edition, and the CPU cooler is the 360mm Corsair H150i Elite LCD with fans set to 90%. The remaining setup details can be seen here if you're interested. And now let's go over system performance. Here are the speeds each CPU was running at. I'm showing the peak frequency each CPU hit across all tests, the average frequency during moderate use and the sustained all-core frequency under a heavy synthetic load with the Ida64 stress test. Again, please note that with MCE and Auto OC, all CPUs are running 100 to 150 megahertz above stock, with the AMD CPUs getting to about 5 gigahertz and the Intel's hitting 5.2 on the 12900K and 4.9 on the 12600K. Note the lower clock speed on the 5800X 3D versus the 5800X here though. When the cache isn't a factor, that's the reason the 5800X still outperforms the X3D. Here my thermal comparisons showing the average and peak temperatures after a 10 minute Ida64 stress test. Here again, it should be pointed out that I'm running modest overclocks on all the CPUs except the 5800X 3D, which can't be overclocked, although it still ran about 1.5 degrees warmer than the regular 5800X, even with PBO2 enabled. Please also note that Ida64's stress test will result in much higher temperatures than what you'd see doing something else like gaming, for example, so mid to low 80s is around what we'd expect given the temps of the other 5000 series Ryzen CPUs. For power draw, I have three values. I'm showing the peak CPU package power as reported by Hardware Info and measuring the wattage drawn by the entire system to show an average during the Blender BMW render and peak overall system draw. Here's where the trade-off happens with PBO2 enabled though, as the Ryzen CPUs, apart from the 5800X 3D, were drawing 160 to 225 watts, while it stayed parked at around 117, more in line with the 5600X. This does indicate that cooling is more challenging with the added 3D V-cache though, given the package power comparison here versus the temperature shown on the previous graph. And now for the benchmarks, starting with CPU compute tasks where AMD isn't even trying to pretend like the 5800X 3D provides a benefit. If you're not gaming, don't bother with the 5800X 3D, kind of like how I'm not gonna bother narrating through all of these slides. Highlights include the new CPU being about 0.5 to 9% slower than the 5800X and cumulatively 4.4% slower across all tests.
Now let's check out some gaming benchmarks. And for the first half, I am again leaning on some of my existing Intel 12 series numbers to provide a broader comparison between CPUs on the market. Note that sometimes 3DV cache doesn't help much, such as in 3D Mark Time Spy, where all graphics test results were within about 1% of each other, or Civilization VI, which is a turn time test instead of looking at frame rates. When it does help, it can help out a lot though, like in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, where the 5800X 3D was 48% faster than the 5800X and 44% faster than the 5900X. So that first set of games showed some varying performance, but since this CPU is such a gaming focused part, I decided to add some more gaming benchmarks due to time constraints. I'm only showing three CPUs for this section though, the 5800X 3D, the 12900K, and the 5900X. And that's all for the compute and gaming benchmarks, so let's sum up the performance. Here are my aggregate scores across all tests, starting with compute performance. I'm also showing gaming performance here for comparison, but sorting by compute. I'm using the 5800X as the 100% baseline, and based on my test, in terms of compute power, the 5800X 3D is not a good value. Just consider that the 5900X, which has 50% more cores and threads, costs $50 less or more, since it has been going for $400 or even below that from major retailers recently, and it offers 30% or so more CPU compute performance. And that's while not even bringing up Intel's competitive offerings, so if it hasn't been hammered home already, if gaming is not a priority, or even for mixed use builds, you should not go for the best gaming CPU because a lot more value can be found elsewhere. In gaming, the results are much more favorable for the 5800X 3D, which came away with the overall win. 12% faster than the 5900X and about 3% faster than the 12900K. That's a decent boost over Intel's CPU that costs $150 or more. And ultimately this is what AMD told us their goal was with this launch. Demonstrate how much of a gaming performance lift an existing CPU could get simply by adding this new cache stacking technology to it, and that's what they did. Here's a final chart with pricing as well because it helps to have it all on one page. And one thing I will note recently is that prices are hard to nail down. The 5900X, for example, MSRP'd for 550 bucks, over time has dropped all the way to 400, and is even now available for 380 bucks on Newegg at the moment if you use an instant rebate. Intel likewise has been more price aggressive with the 12th gen, and sales have popped up for chips like the 12700K. It usually sells for 380 to 400, but has been available for as little as 340. And while that makes it hard for me to make a chart that shows all that info, what it really means is that the CPU market is nice and competitive right now. So manufacturers and retailers have been pushing out deals to try to scoop up those sales. In conclusion, the verdict on the 5800X 3D is not set in stone, and it might change based on your perspective and CPU needs. If gaming is your primary focus, and particularly if you're already running one of the many AM4 motherboards that can be updated to support this new chip, you will likely find it to be a solid upgrade that that can squeeze more frames out of your GPU compared to earlier Ryzen offerings. Value is less of a selling point, however. It might seem like a good gaming CPU for 450 bucks when compared to the $600-ish 12900K, or especially the stupidly priced $800 12900KS, but realistically, not everyone uses their computer solely to game. And in particular, if you're pairing your CPU with a less powerful GPU, like an RTX 3060 or 3070, chances are it will only result in a minimal difference. So if you'll be using your PC for things other than gaming, the 5800X 3D really loses its appeal, as you could opt for the 12-core Ryzen 5900X for 400 bucks or less, or a chip like the Intel 12700K on the LGA 1700 platform, which will likely still have another family of compatible CPUs launching later in the year for more upgrade path potential. All that said, I will reiterate that the 5800X 3D is a nice last hurrah for the AM4 platform 
which has presided over a remarkable shift in AMD's prospects and prosperity, and the successful and impactful addition of 3D vCache technology bodes well for future implementations and the launch of AMD's new AM5 platform later in 2022. And thanks to everyone who made it this far in the video. It has been a bit of a salvage job, but I still wanted to present you all with my benchmark results. I really hope you guys have enjoyed this review. I will put very important links to click down in the description. And if you have comments, I would be interested to read them. So type away and I'll check them out while I make attempt number two at 3090 Ti SLI benchmarks. Subscribe to my channel as well if you haven't already. Check out my store at paulshardware.net for shirts and other cool stuff you can buy. Hit the thumbs up button on your way out if you enjoyed this one, and we'll see you in the next video.